Okay, well, thank you. Um, this is going to be a conversation. So, in fact, considering the number of us here, it might actually work very well if it is a, a larger conversation of sorts. So should we move closer to the We could move closer. Conversations. Um, so, so, do feel you know, that you can, in fact, decide to interject at particular points. Um, but I, I will start off the conversation, and thankfully this is not rehearsed. It is deliberately not rehearsed. So, but I, I'm going to, to start, I guess, by asking a series of questions of Kimathi, and I guess he will, he will do the same. You know, there, there is some, I guess I, I have, so to speak, um, an advantage that I've spent more time thinking about this particular exhibition and Kimathi's work in relationship to it. And you know, Kimathi is right in the relationship between, say, Napoleon and Toussaint Laventure, for instance, and those sort of relationships which, which exist. But I, I am sort of curious and you may have seen it within the exhibition, or the rehang, rather, to give it its um, proper name. The way that art in itself is shifting. Um, art is used over and over again to engage with a number of lived issues. I mean, a theme helps us to understand what work is. And yet, a work of art has to, has to survive beyond the reason why it was created. Otherwise, the work of art fails. Um, it's a bit like listening to um, Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. Um, it, it is a particular song. It's highly political. It is engaging. It makes us think about um, you know, politics at the time. And you know, one, if one plays it at this moment in this room, it still makes us think about our times, you know, what is change ab about. However, it's also a beautiful song outside of its message. And so the two have to sit side by side. So I'm going to start by asking this, you this very question. You know, what is the importance of you of the act of painting beyond the need to say something? Beyond the need to say something? Yes. Oh, well, I suppose it's interesting because you talked about language earlier and, um, and that's very interesting. For, I'm, I'm going to sound like a pedant, a pedant now because you said to say something, but of course in paintings, I, my whole point in painting really is to not say something. Mm -hmm. That's my kind of aim and rather to make and show something. And um, in fact, part of the reason why I paint um, is kind of out of a sort of quite deep suspicion of verbal and um, discursive language. Um, so painting in that sense is almost a kind of a silence for me. It's almost a way of making visible something which I can't otherwise vocalise. Um, and yeah, yeah. So in some ways, the, yeah, the whole of the whole of painting for me is a way of um, not not saying something, and I think partly that comes from a, my own background and 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 which is of being a person who is quite um, you know vocal. I'm not someone who's what's that, what's that phrase you know? Um, oh, I can't remember. Anyway, I'm not a very quiet person really I'm quite a chatter mm -hmm. so painting is a way perhaps of um, enforcing a kind of silence upon myself really even though the act of making a piece of work allows a continuous voice um, you know I think of someone like Adrian Piper for instance who, who points out that in order for a work of art to be successful um, it needs to function as a catalyst and the ideal catalyst, in fact, enters into its situation, causes a reaction without the, the catalyst itself changing in any way. And so in this instance, the artwork is not just about 
silent. Mm. I mean, I think it's great to say it's about silence because then it allows the, kind of the reader to speak. Mm. But actually, it is about bringing about change. Otherwise, if, if it's... I if didn't it's say it wasn't about bringing change. I think change, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely no, in favour of that. Yeah, but change, but change requires a, yes, a particular type of engagement. Yeah. And that engagement needs to be constant. Mm. So, so this reagent, to, to call it something else, has to function, mm. has to be able to communicate, and has to, has to loom large. Mm. I mean, the, the pace of that interaction is not necessarily defined, but it has to occur. Some things happen slowly, some things happen quickly, mm. but it has to remain constant. So, so, so yes, it, you are right about the need for silence, but at the same time, it's it's almost like John Cage's idea of silence, where you force people mm. into a real engagement with what is occurring mm. because silence has been invoked. Mm. I like that idea, forcing people into <laughs> a sort of engagement. Um, it's I suppose, and I don't know whether you 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 agree with this as well, Rainy, which is about um, one of the things that I really enjoy about the work in the practice that we do work in is, and I'm kind of perhaps maybe extemporize a little bit more on silence, and I think your work, because this is a sort of mutual appreciation society, because I've curated Rainey's work <laughs> before as well. So we kind of, I, I have given it some thought. And um, I, I'm, what I suppose interests me about work in a sense, and yours in particular, is the notion of the participation of the viewer mm. and the way that a, a painting or an installation piece or you know a sculpture or a sound installation whatever it does one of the things that i'm interested in about about them is the way that they sort of if you like force a bodily engagement which is somewhat different to certain other which which has its own specific specificity it's her own specificity. And I'm, perhaps I could throw a question back to you, you know, without necessarily answering, is, is that your work, specifically because of the way that you have taken on the notion of filling a space with work, it determines our bodies in a certain way, doesn't mm -hmm. it? What we do when we enter a space physically. And I just wonder perhaps if you could speak a little bit about the role of the body of the spectator in relationship to your work, because it's there's this participatory notion, but it doesn't actually depend upon chess pieces. It depends on something much more happening in the space. Yeah, well, well, it's interesting. I mean, you speak about the body. When I, you know, it. it You're like, going to answer my question, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> like like most artists, you know, um, one starts out and then work on something, work on it, and work on it. And, and I, you know, I am, as I said, I'm quite interested in the question of race and language and power and where they meet. And I realized after a while that if I ever used my body or somebody else's body within my work, that would become the focus, especially when one deals with the question of race. So how, how does one deal with the question of race without using the body? If this is literally the embodiment that is what is being discussed. So yes, I, I am very interested in the body and how the body functions and the relationship between the body and the work. But then, as I said, I, 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 it's like cobbling oneself. I, I chose not to use the body. And so I, I am interested in how the body is forced to move within the gallery. Mm. And in that relationship, something emerges, an awareness happens around about the body. So if you do go to become citizens of the Republic, for instance, there are a number of questions you have to answer, where you, have, you describe yourself. And then there, you know, I can tell you because this is freely available, you know, it literally, you have to describe yourself, I am white. I am light white, I am medium white, I am dark white. I am yellow, I am dark, light yellow, medium yellow, and same with black. Now, people have, have been quite, upset about this because they said, you know, I do not feel myself being described. Well, that's the whole point. In, in that the, the, the language collapses at the very point that we choose 
to set about using it. And the body becomes invoked in other ways. One, becomes to, one comes to an understanding about one's place within this larger discussion because it, 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 there are things controlling it. So within the piece where, with the busts, for instance, one, you know, the viewer is forced to engage with the bust and therefore their own body. And also within the pieces here, that the viewer has to engage. They have to place their own body against what they're looking at. It's not just about them looking, about even myself looking. Because I often find it interesting when, when a piece of mine is installed and I go back and see it. Because I find myself subject to the very same rules I've put other people under. Mm. You know, I can't escape them too. And there is a particular rule as well, isn't there? there because I, you talked about the notion of power. And I mean, in terms of the bodily, the, the way that power acts upon our bodies in quite kind of subtle ways. I mean, particularly you'll see that some of Raimi's work involves these banners. And I like the way that you've picked on the notion of the banners being sort of hung up above you so that you have to look up to them. And this notion of looking up to them is a mechanism of power by which the state, through its organization of signs and symbols, kind of infantilizes us bodily. Mm. Because, of course, this is the thing when you look up, is something which we experience from childhood. Those, you know, our parents, we kind of always look up to them and they, you know, tell us what to do. So when, you, when the, the, the government and you hang sort of these symbols up above and make us look up to them, it's like basically telling you, you're a child and you must look up to us and we'll tell you what to do. So in that sense, are you worried that perhaps you're just reproducing this kind of power relationship between yourself and the viewer? Or are you getting them to, um, to think about it? Because the gallery is a space of contemplation. And is it conscious? Do you feel it's conscious or a bit more subtle than that? Well, it, it, I mean, they are conscious decisions. I, you know, I, I'm constantly aware of the scale of works and the body. So the, in galleries, for instance, and we, we are in one, there is a notional height where the middle of the painting ought to be, and it's five foot six. If, is that the one it that's is, used here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five foot six. That, that's it. Wherever you go, this, you know, this is supposed to be the height. Now, this is not the height for me. So there's, there's always this weird relationship between the center of a painting and me. Um, and, I was, and as you said, for a child, again, this is not the case. So, so it, it is, yes, there is an awareness of these relationships, which are quite useful for me in understanding the way that space functions. And the internal space, as I said, I'm quite interested in concepts. In, how, how to make an internal space manifest is, is a concern of mine. And what now I'm going to internal stop. Internal space. You mean internal to you or internal to the, to the architecture? Well, internal to, to the audience, to the reader. Right. And, and this can be done in many ways. So, for instance, uh, I, I, the show in Belfast, I'll just speak about one of the shows that you've seen, a set of medals were made. And those who took part in the mechanism received a medal. Now, of course, it was about people... Mine is by my bedside locker, I should say, <laughs> in the jewellery box. <laughs> Have you got one there as well? And is that what you mean? Yes. <laughs> and, and these medals alter the way that people see themselves in relationship. You know, so you can take it home, but it still maintains this internal space of the person is shifted. And you know, even myself, I'm not a, you know, I don't make medals. So they go away to be made. And when they come back, they're just as magical to me. As I said, I become subject to my own mechanism, just as magical to me as they are to, to anyone else. So I, I am aware, to a certain extent, the impact that, that these elements have. But I am going to move back to you. No, because I wanted to take okay. you up on that, because I think you stopped at a really important point just there, which mm -hmm. is about the making and this question. And I, and I suppose there is an element to me as well about painting, which is a sort of um, William Morris type of crafts person thing, which is that um, I am very feel very invested in the process of actually making these objects myself. Mm. 
And the objects, if you know the content of my work, a lot of it is about power, race, language, but also class, gender, and all of these kind of power relationships, particularly exploitative relationships. And mm. so for me, this, I'm sort of quite interested in the, you know, William Morris's idea that um, the craftsperson should not be, as it were, alienated from the product of their own labor. They kind of try to manufacture as, as much of it as they can. And as a painter, this is what I try to do, to sort of craft every single mark. But of course, there came a stage, you know, after having invested in this process, when I started to realize, well, actually, you know, this is a, this is a falsehood, you know. Um, I don't manufacture the paints. I don't manufacture the canvas. I don't make the wood. And so then there came a stage in my work when I started to sort of foreground these elements of the sort of pre-made, the ready-made things which come to me from a factory somewhere in the world, from cotton plantations, from linen plantations, from timber factories, and form part of the body of a kind of painting which I actually don't, you know, manufacture. I kind of exploit, I suppose, in a way. So these concerns about the, the economy of making work are also quite sort of central to my, my thoughts. Yeah, um, Sweet Honey in the Rock, who some of you may or may not know, they're an a cappella group. A singing group, yeah. Yeah, do you know, do anyone know them? Anyway, they, 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 they wrote a song called Are My Hands Clean? Mm. And I, you know, w what you're speaking about reminds me of that song um, because they, 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 they wrote this quite beautiful song um, about the making of a blouse. And they, in, in fact, they invoke Haiti mm. in, in that song too. And then right at the end, they say, and then I go to Sears where I, where I buy my blouse at 40% discount. And then the, the, the end of the song is, are my hands clean? And, and you know, it, the, the question you asked, which was what I was going to ask you about my manipulation of the audience, and all art is about manipulation, um, if, if one can just say such a bold statement, I'm sure there are those who disagree with me. Um, this act of manipulation, it, it becomes quite a, com well, forms a complex relationship between what we want to say and how we choose to say it. Because after a while, we, we rely on a particular type of shorthand in order to make things happen. And, and, th and this is what I was going to ask you, is that this, this shorthand that becomes necessary. So for instance, if I were to not necessarily ask the impossible, how could one imagine or, or reimagine the, the, the Haitian revolution mm. without using the codes mm. that are already available? Mm. Yeah. How would one do that? In the same way that you know, one can, uh, you may or may not have heard there was a shooting of miners in South Africa recently, mm -hmm. um, in Marikana, mm -hmm. where the platinum miners were, were, they, they were on strike. The police were called in. And it's a very, if you live in South Africa, it's a long and painful experience. Um, the police were called in. And as the people were running away, they, they opened fire on them and killed a great number. I mean, literally, it's a killing field. So th this, th 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 there is a similarity for me between the Haitian Revolution this desire to construct oneself, to, to stand up against what you see as tyranny, to, to engage in some kind of personal, um, I suppose, personal fight for freedom. And yet it needs to be de depicted. And the codes that are available are those codes that we already know, we already engage with, we already enjoy. So th there's, there's a particular type of pleasure that emerges, say, from seeing someone about to be stabbed in the back. You know, it is about the revolution, but it is also about pleasure. There's a particular delight in seeing violence being enacted. And so there's a complicity with a display of violence, which actually is not about liberation at all. Mm. It is about consumption, Absolutely. a particular type of consumption, which one is going to trace it back, actually falls more to the side of the French than to the side of the Haitian. Mm. So how do you, at this point, seek to reimagine mm. this? 
It's interesting because um, in sort of making that series of paintings, um, which was, I suppose was my first sort of big series of oil paintings, I did embark on a, on a kind of imagination and a sort of journey. It's almost like there's a performance element to it. And it sort of relates, if you like, to very simplistic putting myself in other people's shoes. Because um, although we have this very strong battle between Toussaint Louverture, the forces of the, um, and who led you know, the sort of slave rebellion in, in Haiti, and the French Napoleon. Napoleon. In fact, Toussaint Louverture himself was a bit of a francophile, mm. and was um, he really wanted Haiti to become a part of France. He, the Haitian Revolution was sparked by the French Revolution, and as you know, the French Revolution's slogans were "Egalité, Liberté, Fraternity," and it just so happened that this didn't include the slaves until the Haitians stood up and said, "Yeah, and us too." <laughs> And then there became this tussle about well, whether or not, you know, and at, at first the French were very, you know, they said, yeah, of course, may we, you know, we have to free the slaves, you know. So they kind of went, you know, after f resisting for a while, they went, a you know, they abolished slavery um, after a, it had effectively been abolished by the slaves themselves through their revolution. And then, they, then Napoleon comes back and, you know, tries to turn back time. I want, what I kind of did there was, I sort of imagined myself at the moment that Toussaint Louverture took power on the island and became the governor of the whole island of Hispaniola, which is one of the largest islands in the world. It's about the size of Scotland. And I thought, well, being a sort of francophile as he was, and being a fairly well educated sort of person and you know, having a, an understanding of French culture, he might very well would have known of the works of painters like Jacques Louis David. Mm -hmm. And if he had lived a bit longer, if he had not been captured by Napoleon, taken to the Swiss Alps, starved to death in prison, he might well have commissioned Jack Louis de V to do a kind of um, painting of himself just like that. So in a sense, I was thinking about, if you like, imagining myself as Toussaint Louverture commissioning me to paint in the style of Jack Louis de V mm -hmm. myself. So... We do get a bit lost in all of these, um, you know, circles of sort of power and artistic invention. But that's how I conceived it at the time. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it does. I mean, we have, have we talked out the time. No, no, we've, we we were supposed to be for twenty minutes, and we've hit twenty minutes. So, so are there any? There must be. I, I could actually do that, but I, I can tell you about that in a sort of way, because I think there's two things. I mean, firstly, I have, been, I have kind of also um, looked at contemporary conflicts, but I think one of the things about history anyway is that history is a contemporary conflict. History isn't... The past doesn't exist, you know what I mean? It's, it's over. There's no... There is no past. What there is is now and how we think about what may or may not have happened and how we remember and record it. So for me, I think, um, I suppose there's a sort of, um, oh, I shouldn't have left my phone on. <laughs> so for me, there's a kind of um, thinking about, well, putting this, and I sort of did it on the screen there, like bringing in this sort of neoclassical style painting of Toussaint Louverture and setting it, as it were, against the the contemporary um, sort of glorification of Napoleon is a contemporary battle. It's something that's happening today. It's about how we remember the past, about how... The, how I mean, if you look at that, um, that quotation of Napoleon about putting people into slavery and his brother were about exterminating people, are we saying that what, 100 years from now we'll have in... Because I'm also part Jewish, I say that. Are we going to have, like, Hitler paintings and that's just okay you know the genocide mass murder sort of um world war yeah that's all good we just celebrate it because it's nice art or is there something at stake in today's um today's world because you know 
France, from my perspective, is a deeply racist country. Britain, I should also say, has its own problems with racism. And some of these problems are related to how we think about and memorialize the past. If you have in your you know, national history, or in Europe's history, people like Napoleon who are sort of genocidal maniacs and are still being glorified, what is the possibility for that um, mentality continuing today? What possibilities does that engender? Is there any surprise that we have, you know, um, the Srebrenica's and the Auschwitz's, if this is how we memorialize genocidal maniacs like Napoleon? So this is maybe answering the question about, I don't see history as being about the past, it's, it's about today. Yeah. I think um, perhaps, I mean, perhaps my painting would be more truthful than David's. That might be one way of thinking about it. Um, perhaps it's less propagandistic, because of course when Napoleon was alive, so was David, and that was done as a sort of, this is today, and I'm doing something which is about a, a, a past which has been really submerged and kind of lost from from the collective consciousness of the West, that of the three revolutions which sort of changed the world at that period of time, the American, the French, and the Haitian, one of them has sort of disappeared from the, you know, collective consciousness of world memory. It just so happens to be that's the one in which black people took the leading role and which slavery was the main target. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to shy away from accusations of being a propagandist for anti slavery democratic revolution. I mean, Toussaint himself wrote, I believe, um, because Toussaint wrote to Napoleon, they had a, a kind of um, uh, a diplomatic um, exchange of, um, you know, letters. And in his writings, he did actually compare himself to Napoleon very directly. And um, that might have been partly what made Napoleon hate him so much and be determined to destroy him, because obviously he wasn't a guy who tolerated sort of rivals in, within the empire. So, um, so I'm not. I don't think that Tusa himself would have been averse to that. And in a sense, for me, that is partly a kind of a critique, yeah. because it's clear that whatever revolution took place in Haiti, you know, th th from the subsequent events in the country, things have not gone necessarily according to plan, according to how perhaps the Haitians themselves would have best envisaged that. And in some respects, that is rooted in the events of the revolution. For example, shortly after the revolution, the person who actually led the um, people to victory and expelled the French declared himself to be emperor. And perhaps in that, sort of, we have a sort of beginning of a kind of a hubris, that the, the, the democratic potential was undermined. So perhaps my painting does, yes, it kind of, it takes that on board and think, you know, maybe there is, and ask people to consider, because if you look underneath the horse, there's a sort of, there's a guy, a black guy, kind of lying there stripped naked with his limbs all bloodied, and it thinks about this question of sacrifice, what, what, you know, all the pain that we go through in these transformations. I, mean, I, I do think that the running alongside, I mean, this, this exchange, is that the, our ability to depict and to depict quickly is fairly limited. So if there's someone on a horse with you know, obviously competent enough to ride his horse in one hand while it is rearing with a sword in the other, we, we see power. We understand that that is the person to pay attention to. And uh, you know, David did not paint Napoleon in the way he did because he wanted to depict Napoleon in the way he did, if the tautology makes sense. He wanted Napoleon to fit 
in line with all the other great depictions mm -hmm. of power mm -hmm. that we had already come to understand. So even if you didn't know that that was Napoleon, even if you didn't know it was the Alps, you knew it was someone of substance mm -hmm. doing something of significance Absolutely. just by looking at it. And so the, the, this relationship comes up over and over and over again in the way that people are presented presently. I mean, to, to you know, the, the, I, I, I can hazard a guess, and it probably will be a fair one, that someone somewhere is making a bust of a leader out of marble as I speak. You know, it's happening. I don't know where it's happening, but I can assure you it's happening. Because there's such a long history of this that, you know, I'm, you know, just deliver this head and everyone thinks, yeah, you know, substance. And so I, I think that, you know, Toussaint being on the horse and the horse rearing and all the rest of it, yes, it is propaganda, but it is in the way that propaganda works. So you know, I, I see it as propaganda, but then propaganda has its place. I mean, how else do we bring about change um, without a particular type of propaganda? And one of my favorite, well, not one of my favorite films, but one of, uh, one of my favorite films that deals with this question, the film called um, Starship Troopers. All oh, right, yeah, it's by, Ver, what's his name, Ver, Ver, Verhoeven. Yes, Ooh, Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you, I don't know if anyone else has seen Starship Troopers. Has anyone ever seen Starship Troopers? <laughs> yeah, that's how I spend my Before spare time. <laughs> Confess. <laughs> these, these are troopers that go off fighting arachnids or some sort or the other. They're huge insect-like things. They, they just go off. But in, interspersed between the story mm. are these ads. <coughs> and these ads come up, and the first time you watch it, if you don't know that the ads are part of the film, you may actually think there's something going on here. Someone's made a mistake. But th because it's not an ad on TV, the whole screen becomes the ad. This is, you know, private so-and-so, great fighter, great this, great that. You know, let's go out and destroy the enemy. And then it cuts back to the film, as if nothing has happened in between. And this goes through, and Star I, I think Starship Trooper is now in its fourth incarnation, including one animated film. And over time, you come to re you know, the, the viewer comes to realize that the, 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 the ability to convince the population to make their sacrifices is just as important as what is happening. So they could end the war tomorrow. But how do you keep a war going? How do you, or rather, how can people be encouraged to engage with any type of activity without a particular type of propaganda? So, so th this happened, I mean, the, in one of them, I've watched them all, um, religion becomes a question. They do not, you know, people do not want to believe in God, and then, in a God, because, uh, and then they have to believe in a God. And then all the politicians who are both military people shift their positions along the way. So depictions are really important. Now, how does someone in Marikana think of Tucson Aventura now? in an engagement. It has to be in a particular form that allows them to move forward. And the reality of a revolutionary is never the same as the truth of it. You know, the, the revolutionary is never always sure about their victory. The revolutionary always has poor moments. They always fail. And yet we, we can't imagine the revolutionary, the leader, at that moment of crisis because then they stop being revolutionary. And so I think you're right. This, the, the, the propagandist element is to remind us of those moments that we need. And the rest, well, I guess it just happened. When I first saw the painting, my first good reaction to it was, my God, have we learned nothing? You know, because it was the size of the painting, the colors we used, it just hit me. And then I started to look at all the intricacies of it and who was what and that but it was like um you know when you see armistice day and peace at the cenotaph and i just think all the people that are getting killed and it and, and that's the reaction i had to it and mm. on there's a kind of level, horror on that level mm. and then because it was a painting because of the size because of the color 
that's what you would do for me. Mm. I didn't know anything about HP. Mm. I didn't know, um, as I say, it's just a gut reaction to it. Down to that level, I think it's, it's powerful. That's really beautiful that you should say that because, um, and especially you mentioned the Armistice Day, and what I'd had asked you to do, and perhaps Maggie, you could organise this for the school groups that can't. I mean, if you can see where in the two paintings, if the children can find the portrait of Tony Blair, <laughs> because there is one. <laughs> so I, I, and certainly when the paintings were made, actually, it was at a time of war, mm -hmm. because this was just at the. I started making that series at the beginning of the sort of war against um, Iraq and, mm -hmm. and Afghanistan, and certainly this notion of the demonization of a person far away and the sending of a European army to sort of depose them in the name of, you know, democracy. democracy. And, yeah, I mean, we are, we certainly, and, and it, that was part of my, um, you know, the, the whole thing. It was actually, you know, absolutely what you're saying. You know, we seem to be, and what was interesting to me about it as well is because the way that we were taught told about particularly Saddam Hussein that he is basically the devil incarnate yeah. and that he had to be destroyed is so close to the way that the French spoke about Toussaint Louverture that then it really starts making you question about you know all of the you know propaganda that swirls around war and the motivation about you know and, and what is being done in the name of various states and yeah. I'm hoping that yeah that that under that notion of um, the horror of uh, sort of conflict is definitely part of what I'm seeking to sort of um, evoke. Because although I think um, the it was right for the African slaves or to rise up and liberate themselves, at the same time, you know, half of the population were killed. Sixty thousand French men. Um, died and actually 13,000 British soldiers died in that war, on, unfortunately on the wrong side, trying to you know re-establish slavery. So, you know, it, 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 to me it was quite um, heartfelt looking back, but also looking at where we are, you know, today. And yet, you know, and I say and yet, so you can see that it's a be a slight contradiction here. Um, I'm compelled to to also recognize the sense of pride that people feel at the Cenotaph. Mm. You know, they feel really proud. You know, they, they their heart looms bigger in their chests as they recognize what people have done. Um, and you see, th and, and this is where the complication emerges for me, both personally and in the rehang of the Usher Gallery, mm. that in all those names, people go there with pride. Say, ah, oh, see, that's, that was my great uncle right there who died. It is not, uh, the question is never what they died for. It is just that they died and the, they're Im literally immemorialized. Right? They're always going to be there. Unless there is some serious business goes on in London, the cenotaph will be there for the next, I don't know, however long people remain in the state where these things remain necessary, those monuments are going to remain in place. And that sense of pride, which is linked to this violence, is also incredibly important and useful. Um, if next to on on the mall there are uh, the mall rather there are a number of, of smaller memorials. I mean, some of them you know, to the Zulu Wars, for instance. Mm -hmm. And those two, you know, they, they hold pride of place. People are proud that. They, they took part in this. And, and so it, it, it is, there's a very complex relationship that emerges. On one hand, yes, you're right, do we, do we not learn from these experiences? You know, they, do they merely remain in place? And yet, even in the not learning, in the repetition of these things, something emerges. When I flew into Britain, um, I got on the tube and hit the center of London. And as I got into... Uh, I changed trains at Old Street. That was where I finally emerged, at Old Street. And I was walking out to, to go to see someone. There was a person selling um, something for heroes. Help for heroes. Help for heroes. Mm -hmm. 
in the middle of the underground station selling these things. Well, I'm forced into a moment of ambivalence because they're heroes. I mean, you know, the, 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 it, already we're told these are heroes. These are people of fighting wars. Depending on your politics, they have no business being off in these places at the moment. Britain is not under any particular threat. You know, the long-range missiles that were supposed to come flying across the seas are not on their way. So what are the wars? You know, and in, in 20 years' time, when the roll call is made of the people who died in this war, people are also going to go up, and they're also going to have a sense of pride. And then, and then government puts them there, so that is political. But I, I don't feel pride in my country because I think we did a lot of things in the past, colonising everything, that we had no right to go and change people's culture. You know, UB40... They, they did it to their own self-exclusions. And, and the pride I feel you get is um, comradeship and, you know, I think it's the camouflage. I think it's a really interesting point that you should make, actually. And, you know, I was reading, a, I have a book on my shelf, which I, I've, you know, had this, and it's called um, Slavery and Other Forms of Unfree Labour. And um, what the writer talks about, I can't remember the writer's name, but what she, one of the, the essays that appears in the book says that the closest institution to slavery that exists in the modern world is the military. Because... Once you get in the military, that's it. You have to obey your master, yeah. even unto death. And um, then this raises a really interesting political question, isn't it, about we're proud of people who surrender, if you like, their individual will to a certain degree, or are they compelled to surrender? I mean, one of the things that I'm aware of, particularly living in these kind of... Um, Western societies where there's a great deal of wealth, to put it bluntly, um, a, a mass spread of wealth compared to many other regions, is the sort of social class of people who are in um, the military. Um, did you, was it you mentioned Adrian Piper hmm. earlier? The Adrian Piper, who's uh, another artist, she wrote a philosophical paper in which she suggested that, um, that on the basis of philosophical right, that as only the upper classes, from her perspective, benefit from the imperial wars waged by the United States, of which she was a citizen then, then conscription and military service should only apply to upper class people. Because after all, the lower class people who are going to go up are just basically going to get killed or end up unemployed or mentally traumatized by their experiences. And there's an interesting question about who are the young men and women who are sent off um, to be maimed in these circumstances, often, I mean, I don't want to be prejudiced, they seem to be people from very straitened circumstances who, in some ways, don't have a choice, um, or perhaps feel that they've got no choice. I've watched some documentary a while ago about, um, you know, um, uh, estates in the north of England and some, you know, young guys there who've got left the school with very little qualifications, very little hope in life, and they basically think, well, look, I can join the army. And there's this notion of actually being economically compelled into a situation where you are virtually a slave, sent off to kill. Yeah, it's a very disturbing um, yeah, I think that's why set of circumstances. so many Gurkhas have fought for the British army mm. over the last couple of centuries. Um, it, they, they still come forward from the poor to mm. join the mm. British Army, even today, in far greater numbers than the British Army are prepared to take. Right. And the reason they come is because Nepal is one of the poorest countries in, in the world. world. Absolutely. And that's not to, to denigrate them at all, because their history uh, is, uh, is something that everybody in this country is proud of. Mm. That's the role of the Gurkhas in uh, victories, uh, Brit British victories in the past. And when I look at, uh, when, I listen, when I hear about the story of uh, Toussaint Louverture and the slaves 
I'm proud of two thousand displays. I mm. think they're that's brilliant. You know, mm. Throwing off the yoke of the masters, etc., etc. And the French are incredibly proud of Napoleon, who on his on the retreat from Moscow abandoned his men, came back to France, and left them to their own devices. They nearly all died, mm. either picked off by the Russians, they starved, or they froze to death, and only a remnant got back to France. And yet, when he started his next campaign, they were all queuing up to fight for him. Mm. And yet he was an absolute bastard. <laughs> but they're absolutely <laughs> proud of him. Mm. And in this country, you're terribly proud of the same kind of people like the Duke of Wellington mm. for you know, knocking him for six. But it, did, it is said that the Duke of Wellington wept on the battlefield of Waterloo at the end of the battle mm. because of all the dead. Mm. And just one more thing, if you, the, the earliest photographs I know of, of, of uh, a battlefield are from the American Civil War. That's right, yeah. And that's only 50 years after the Battle of Waterloo. And there's nothing heroic about them at mm. all. They're dismal and depressing and, and completely unheroic and completely mundane and normal. Mm. And, and in a way that's, you know, that, that reflects more the reality of war than all the uh, heroic statues and monuments and paintings and things, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Although by now we can, we can manipulate photographs so well that we can make photographs seem like the rea reality of war. So modern photographs of war don't have that power that the, those Gettysburg photographs do. I can best answer in two parts. You know, there are two questions. I curate, I, mean, I started curating as a political act, as part of my practice as an artist. Mm. I started curating because lots of artists who were black simply weren't being exhibited. Mm. I mean, this was the reality of it. And as you can tell, I'm not that old. Um, but you know, times have changed, thankfully. And I, I became aware that it, it is. It's one thing to make a work of art. It's another thing to display a work of art. It's another thing for that work of art to have any kind of resonance in its society. And so to, to curate was to, was to take control, partly of my own existence and of existence of people around me. I mean, I didn't, have, I didn't handpick people. I didn't, you know, these are people who are making their own work, who I could then engage with, work that excited me, work that, you know, I listen to, uh, I guess, far too much music, but, you know, like Tupac Shakur, there's a really good song called Black Jesus, where he talks about Black Jesus. You know, I need someone who bleeds like me, who feels like me, who understands what I'm talking about. You know, not a Jesus who, who has a particular set of morals, because, you know, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and be a drug dealer. I need a Jesus that understands that I need to be a drug dealer or else I don't need a Jesus at all. He didn't add the, not need a Jesus, but there is a relationship between the two. So, so to curate is to, is to empower oneself and to empower a set of things. So it, and, and so this is why I need two parts, because to be an artist is, is much more, at least for me, than making objects that simply function within a, an economic and cultural market. It needs to be much more much, much more than that for me. It needs to lead to a particular type of transformation, both of myself and my audience. So the people that stick in my head, uh, and I may, I'm working on a piece for a show for, for next year, a lot of people I read are economists and political thinkers. And one of my, my favorite philosopher, um, political philosopher of all time, is Machiavelli. I mean, most people think he's the devil, but actually he's not. But yeah, maybe he is. Okay. But... So, so, so there is that moment where to curate is, in fact, to be an artist, to, to, to engage actively in what it means to produce work. But then when I am curating for an exhibition or, or I take on a role as a curator, 
I also realized I have a responsibility beyond my own idiosyncrasies. I take on a particular type of responsibility. Uh, and with a level of seriousness, I, sometimes I don't even take my own work. And at that point, yes, I can argue that there is a particular type of division that occurs. And that, and that responsibility is, um, is, in fact, quite worthwhile. It means I look differently. I have to engage differently. And so the, the, it, the, the two um, run side by side, this, this idea that there is a separation. Uh, you know, it would be a bit glib to say it is almost Zen-like. You know, at the very point where you realize that there's separation, that's where you realize that, in fact, the, the two merge together. And in order for me to function appropriately and usefully as a curator in any instance, I also have to recognize that this is part of my practice. Now, all artists have a huge ego. Um, they may choose to speak about it or not, but they do. I mean, most people have a huge ego. Just that most artists put their ego on show. So, you know, you can see. And to, to curate is to, is to recede to a certain extent. Even if you make work as part of something, your primary, or rather my primary objective, is not actually to say, hey, it, it's Raimi here, even though my name is on the box and looks great. But it's actually to recede to a certain extent. And that, that has to be, in my, in, for me, is a conscious act. So I'm aware that I am doing this. Because if I'm not aware, then one day I'm just going to wake up really angry when I speak to an artist who then you know, performs their artistry and becomes a prima donna. I have to say, OK, fine. Yes, it is your moment to be the prima donna and my moment to function as a curator. So th it, it, it's, I mean, I would like to say it, it is seamless. But yes, it, it is it is it's a constant understanding within myself. And also, I really enjoy the act of curating. Um, it's, I learn an awful lot, both about, both about myself and about other works within that act, and that one needs to really understand the work in order to make it do its job properly within an exhibition. If it's just a case of selecting and putting them on the wall, then you know, things just fall flat, because there is not this coming together. It's like, it's like making a decent salad sometimes. You know, some things work, some things don't, and then you need the dressing. Thank you very much. Yeah.